Okay, it's Brian. And Nick. Yeah. We're back talking uh, arm requests, specifically for a fella called Joel who's um, been kind enough to request a little bit more. So, hi Joel. Yeah. Joel, for some reason you find what Nick and I say uh, as insightful. So we'll try and bounce off one another a wee bit. Um, Nick has said to me uh, I should talk about the issue of local debt, local authorities, local government. What is it that's um, brought us to a, a very uh, difficult place? Because I actually think it's pretty universal. All around the uh, Western world, if you like, uh, local governments have got themselves into a bit of a tight corner with overspending. <clears throat> this paradigm, though, really, of borrow and spend, sell and spend, and tax and spend, but spend as if uh, there's no uh, tomorrow, has actually caused us quite a lot of grief. And the main problem, of course, is that when you're spending, you're racking up uh, interest on your debt, and eventually that has to be repaid. Well, in 2000, for example, bringing it back to a local uh, uh, situation, Wellington City Council had around about $5.3 million of interest debt per annum. It's now climbed to well over $20 million, and we're actually a small city. We're around about 60,000 ratepayers. So that's a huge problem for us. And, of course, uh, lending institutions are now sent, uh, 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 actually enforcing debt levels. They're saying you can borrow up to so much and then your credit rating's going to actually change. And I think actually the banks with individuals are much harsher. So there are, Nick, there's an opening. Well, it's, it's an interesting one for Brian to talk about because Brian is actually a... Move in a bit, Brian. Brian has actually uh, been on the council for a number of years, so he's, he's got the inside running on exactly how it works. But I asked Brian um, a, a fairly pertinent question to which... Um, Brian and I don't have an answer to, but I go back to something which happened in the uh, 1980s in New Zealand, but it's, it's happened all uh, around the world, and um, that is that we have had uh, municipal authorities, which when we were children back in the 50s and earlier, um, you know, were basically run by the, uh, you know, a cooperative, the local people, aka the ratepayers, and they did everything. They, they had all these services in-house and what we've been forced to do here is actually put the services out-house and we tender them out to bodies who actually have to have a, uh, you know, a, a profit margin within their, um, their particular operating costs because no private sector people, and I'm a private sector person, um, are going to actually do a job for nothing. They're going to look for a profit. And my question to Brian, and we, we both looked blankly at each other, was well, I wonder how much profit has... Um, gone out the door in the past 25 years to local bodies here in New Zealand and what the total of that would be and have a look at that compared to the debt. I don't have a simple answer but I'd love to know because mm. I suspect what we've actually done is impoverished ourselves by actually trying to run something in a commercial model which was never really set up to be done commercially. Mm. Um, any comment on that Brian? Well look with a lot of trouble we could probably get a rough picture of what's happened to that transfer of wealth, because that's what's taken place. But uh, profit is an extra cost to the consumer. And local government was sort, set up on the basis that it would deliver services at cost. And it didn't have to attract the <clears throat> profit, extra profit, because, well, it had the rates or the yeah. local tax to begin with. And, and there, there's this uh, long-running argument, if you, you go back and you read Adam Smith, uh, he comments on it, so do all of the classical economists, and they say, well, there are things which um, are needed for an infrastructure to sustain itself and for businesses to operate within. And um, so those, those things uh, really don't contribute to a market. Um, they don't contribute to a, any sort of generation of wealth. They're actually parasitic of already generated wealth. And this is why we had councils uh, providing a lot of these services or government providing a lot of these services because, you know, the private sector was supposed to go off and actually do something and make a profit rather than suck the juice out of what was already made. And um, that's putting it in very much a layman's term, but it's the old rent versus uh, creation. Um, and what I see now by allowing the private sector in and to do these things is we get a rentier mentality upon what has to be had. Um, 
we're following the American model. Uh, Joel, you're out there in the US, I believe. Um, we've seen it fail there. We've seen the sinking lid policy on councils throughout California and so on. Where now, you know, the weeds are growing through the footpath and the rubbish doesn't get collected. Um, yeah, interesting scenario. It's uh, not good, but it seems to be where uh, uh, central government here seems to want to drive things to. Yeah. Well, back again to this whole formula of privatising the profits and socialising the losses. And uh, what uh, the levels of sustainability uh, we uh, can actually live with, um, how do we articulate what that is, and the problem of course is that with this new paradigm that's emerged, that we can't borrow, uh, you know, as if there's no tomorrow, uh, is uh, just exactly what are our expectations, and I don't actually believe we can continue with the whole idea of growth any longer. So uh, that's a big challenge, and also uh, those of you who read a lot, and I'm sure amongst the uh, YouTube uh, tubers, there's uh, heaps of people who are familiar with the whole notion of overshoot, that we've overshot our carrying capacity as a planet, and that there's just too many of us now to actually to actually cope with, and the issue of uh, providing a, a sustainable uh, backdrop is not being dealt with really at all and no. so the consequence is that uh, is narrow I mean basically the solution to a problem is actually traditionally we go and fight and kill one another because we never did solve the issue of the economic disparity <clears throat> that drove uh, the first and the second world war yeah it's um People out there um, reading the blogs, there's a couple in particular I'd encourage at the moment. Um, the Arch Druid reports have uh, been writing on uh, the American Empire and the sort of models of empire, how we, you know, are now living in a very much uh, a co well, it's not even covert, but it's not uh, anything other than an American um, financial empire. And the whole thing has reached the end of its ability to sustain itself because of the resource depletions, uh, things like oil having um, reached a peak of production. Um, we know that over there in the States and in Britain they're just printing money to actually fill up debts and to keep the whole thing, uh, I suppose solvent's not the right word because the whole thing is insolvent, but um, to keep a facade of uh, normality. and. What um, struck me here out in the uh, periphery of empire was the adherence of our people um, here to this facade, this, um, this whole mirage of what is going on. And we had a classic example. One of our greatest problems is youth unemployment. We um, under 25s. Mm. We've got a massive number of people in training, uh, universities. That's probably a quarter of the under 25s racking up a debt against the rest of our society because we don't seem to be prepared to pay them to um, study or to actually pay to create jobs for them. We'd rather they carry the burden onwards. Um, then we've also got a large uh, further chunk. So we, in real terms, we might have somewhere in the region of one in three under 25s out of real work. And um, we're not doing anything about it. No. At the same time, uh, we've got um, an institution from government um, one of our central uh, departments, um, predicting that we're going to create a massive number of jobs in the next three years because the idiots in Treasury have said, we're going to have growth. And I'm saying, OK, I'm out there in business land. You just show me where this growth is coming from, boys, because it's not happening, and it's not happening worldwide. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you have the um, emergence of society, and then society needs a way of uh, making transactions and so therefore uh, money is created and uh, the um, bizarre thing was that when uh, the private profit takers took over control of the creation of money because in fact actually it should be the role of governments to actually control uh, uh, the money supply and uh, so we have this ridiculous situation where uh, now uh, the only way that we can actually uh, do, see, do business 
is that there uh, is currency and currency is is controlled by uh, private profit and, and that is just so wrong because basically it it allows and creates this incredible inequity and all of the social uh, dysfunction that we've got where you've got uh, poverty and wealth and this uh, growing gap between the rich and the poor which you know it's basically just a set of social arrangements there's nothing written in stone that this is the way it should be and if we're going to solve our serious uh, problems this is one of the major obstacles to addressing that and I guess you know if you're going to allow uh, money supply to be controlled by the banks, by the private banks, you're also going to actually uh, create huge problems with education because, you know, everything stems, as Marx says, the economic base determines your social infrastructure. Yeah. And that's a very profound thing when you think about it. I, I think he probably knew a little bit more about business than a lot of people would um, suggest. Um, mm. And if he's talking about the economic base, I, I can give you a fairly good example of what's happening in the company I'm working with at the moment. We, uh, we know that we've got a certain size market. And we know, you know, I figured there's going to be no growth in that market um, over the next few years. So we're looking at broadening we, which markets we get into and we're looking at growing. Now, I believe we can actually grow our company, but growing our company... Um, in the past, a whole pile of companies could grow. Um, now I think the total aggregate gain will be to those who can actually grow their company at the expense of other companies. And where I um, get efficiencies, I will cause pain at the other end. Um, that's the natural nature of how companies work. It's a competitive environment. But um, in the past, we've probably not had to compete as hard. And the whole pie has been growing, so we've been able to expand to actually um, take take advantage of that pie. Now what we're doing is we're actually going to fight one another. And um, I'm confident from my company's viewpoint, because I can see that's what we have to do. We plan for it, but anyone who isn't planning for that is going to actually lose in terms of the, um, the, the current economic model of, you know, companies doing business in a marketplace. Um, what really frightens me is the, the macro scale where there seems to be no recognition that uh, a managed shrinkage um, would be a preferable thing to waking up one morning and finding that the uh, horse is bolted and that the, um, the stable is reduced from 100 square metres to 5 square metres. Mm. And um, that, that is where uh, this collective blindness uh, fits in. Mm. And we had, Brian listened to something this morning on the radio and I'm looking forward to it as well. We've got Nicole Foss from The Automatic Earth um, talking about financial crisis and um, energy crisis. Uh, she's on tour here in New Zealand and um, she had a very interesting interview with one of the ladies on the radio here in New Zealand um, who just took this sort of contentious um, attitude like, oh, I don't believe what you're saying. Uh, is that how you saw it, Brian? Yes, I did. But actually, it was very interesting because the uh, whole thing about a collapse or a burst bubble is that you don't have any control. It's there one moment and then it's gone. Um, hey, Nick, um, I think we have to actually pause here because um, we'll be making a uh, video that's too long. Yep. And But hey, listen, guys, um, we'll look forward to seeing you again next time. Yeah, that's great. See you, guys.